So um, with this, thank you very much, thank Roger. You. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. This uh, series of talks is named to honor a really, really great person. Not only was uh, Dr. Richard Newton an excellent researcher and teacher, business builder, he was a great humanitarian. He wanted to make a difference in the world, and he did. He uh, had a remarkable ability to engage so many people in his life, professionally and personally, and he would bring out the best of each of us, and it was wonderful to be in his midst. So I was um, a junior engineering student at Cornell, and I wanted to have an unusual, big, a big difference in my spring break. So I teamed up with my buddy Bill, and we applied to a whole bunch of magazines and TV networks to offer our services as adventurers. Adventurers with excellent communication skills. Mind you, we had no experience and never had done anything like this before. But a new magazine at the time uh, bit. And uh, the magazine called Quest was sort of a cross between a New Yorker and a National Geographic. They answered our call. So come spring break, they, uh, they paid for our travel to New York City. And for the first time, I took a limousine uh, to one of the, well, to the single fanciest hotel room I've ever seen in the Plaza Hotel in New York City. And the next morning, the editorial staff met us downstairs for breakfast, where they told us what our challenge would be. We were to attempt the first transcontinental race without the use of any commercial transportation and with only $25 in our pockets, a race to go from New York City to San Francisco. First person there, if either one of us makes it, wins 500 bucks, which at that time was 500 bucks out of a $3,500 tuition bill. And um, we, were, uh, we were then asked to flip a coin. And I was sent in one limo to, off to uh, Teterboro, New Jersey, a large private airport there, and my buddy off to LaGuardia Airport in New York. The assumption being, of course, that the fastest way to go from one coast to the other was by air. I was 21 years old. Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an amateur radio operator. Uh, I've passed a number of federal uh, licensing exams to be able to use shortwave radios to communicate with people all over the world. And my uh, most exciting such contact occurred one day when I was calling CQ to see if anyone out there wanted to talk to me, and a station from Jordan answered my call. His call sign was JY1. He was one of the most famous amateur radio operators in the world. He was the King of Jordan, King Hussein I. And after our communication, we exchanged postcards. They're called QSL cards. Here's mine, the age of 14. And here's his. Now, that little crown is actual gold. He signed the picture of himself put it in with the card and signed the confirmation of the contact, signed it himself, sent me a picture of, I guess, outlooking one of his, his, uh, his vacation residences, and puts it into an envelope addressed to me with a picture of himself on the stamp. <laughs> well, that was pretty cool. And that night, when we had our family dinner conversation, I asked Dad, how did things go? He said, the lecture I did was fine. Students stayed awake. Mom, um, yeah, I did the ad for the department store I work for. It's fine. And 
hey, bro, how did it go? I, oh, I won my tennis game. And I said, no, oh, and I talked to the King of Jordan today. <laughs> that was a great opportunity for a 14-year-old. A couple of years later, my brother and I, well, my brother somewhat excitedly informed me that it was a real SOS, real emergency being called out on our radio station. And I, when I joined him to monitor the communications, we heard many such calls from Nicaragua. A terrible earthquake had just devastated Managua, and amateur radio was the only form of communications out. For the next several days, my brother and I became one of the key conduits of relief supply and personal survival notification communications between our country and Nicaragua. And at the ages of 15 and 16, we learned quickly how with the right resources and skills, one can make a positive contribution uh, in an emergency. And since it was a pretty unusual thing at the time for a 15 and 16 year old to be reporting to the world about what was going on, this was the wire services photo that was sent throughout the world, it was printed in, in newspapers throughout the world of these two young kids who were one of the primary conduits of communications during the first three or four days post earthquake. At the age of 17, at the height of one of our country's worst engineering industry recessions post-World War II, I started a company to rent out fellow high school students as electronics technicians to uh, Boston area companies at about half the going rate for technicians. At that time, we charged about five to six dollars an hour for our services. The business took off. We were all Ivy League bound, hardworking students, love solving problems, and making some extra dough. With the right tools and opportunity, we were off to the races. I made enough money to have some really terrific dates, and I was also the youngest corporate president in Massachusetts. My voice was just changing at the time, <laughs> and my mom would sometimes answer the business phone, Raji, it's a business call for you, which was pretty embarrassing, but the business seemed to work. So I'm in Teterboro Airport, New Jersey. It is pouring. Horrible, horrible stormy weather. And I thought the best place to search for flights would be where they fill up for gas. I went to what is called the flight base operator and started introducing myself to everybody in sight. Pilots, service crews, passengers, anybody. I introduced myself as a Cornell student an engineering student looking to win a race across the country and 500 bucks towards tuition. The responses were threats to arrest me for trespassing, for violating federal aviation laws, and of course, I had lots of door slamming and wave offs, angry wave offs. But finally, a couple of guys had pity on me and offered me a ride to White Plains, New York, which was due north. Uh, I took it. It was the only ride out that night. So arrived around 4 p.m., small airport. Not a lot of possibilities to get out of there. And I started calling a Cornell buddy for a place to spend the night when somebody grabbed my sleeves and directed me to a flight he had secured for me in out to Allentown, Pennsylvania. It was a rocky trip in very poor weather, but we landed safe and sound. I called my parents, who were worried beyond description, and told them I was probably going to get stuck there, which pleased them to no end. It was 4.30, and then I engaged in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in one of the most aggressive four hours of jibber-jabber in my entire life. There were no private planes to leave, scheduled to leave that night. I tried to convince commercial airlines to give me a free ticket. No dice. I asked a cab company to start driving me west until dawn and the next airport. No dice. I begged a really nice girl at the Hertz rental counter to rent me a car for free or drive me herself west. <laughs> no dice. Everyone at the airport knew what I was up to at that point. And then the police came up to me and said the airport was closing in 15 minutes. And while they had a lot of sympathy for me, 
that if I was there in 15 minutes, they were going to arrest me for loitering. I picked up the phone and made a bold offer, which would ultimately serve me quite well. At the age of 25, I was an engineer at Hughes Aircraft, now a division of Boeing, a project manager in charge of a new technology initiative in the area of wireless communications, spread spectrum systems. And since this was really cool stuff, I was able to attract to my project the very top talent in the company. All of these people were better design engineers. I committed to attracting the resources to support our efforts to prove that we could build some of these key components of these new communication systems, thereby, thereby validating the technology as cost effective for efficient, secure satellite to person communications. Whereas most folks would look to hide under the table if asked to speak at design briefings, I relish the opportunity to present and defend our designs and project plans. And if we ran out of money from one budget, I would go by, find another sponsor for our R&D adventures and find that money by hook or crook. Without the best bosses in the whole wide world, I never would have been able to do this work. And I was armed with some experience and confidence that a young person could make a difference within a large system or could move mountains if it was supported by the finest talent combined with determination and tenacity. Well, I've had this uh, same business partner for, uh, and friend for 35 years. And there have been articles written in um, Harvard Business Review about how if you want to be an entrepreneur, very often if you're if some of the people you start your company with are your closest and most trusted and best friends, the probability of success goes way up for the business, let alone for your professional careers. That would certainly prove the case with Danny and myself. So when at the ages of 27, Danny and I were offered an opportunity to start a telecom company only months before the entire telecommunications industry was broken up, it was a monopoly in this country, and until 1984, and deregulated, we grabbed this opportunity to come to Berkeley and start this company. The deal was that we would sell consulting services leveraging our skills as communication systems engineers and that we would secure contracts to solve telecom problems and design communication systems for hire on a time and materials basis. The VC who supported us would mentor us in selling contract that's in, in selling and contract development techniques. They would risk about a year, maybe two, of our salaries while we tried to break even. It became apparent that the only way to sell business was to get on the telephone and talk to people. And on our first day, we kind of just stared at the telephones. Wow, this is, it's just, this is it. And uh, finally, the end of the first day, my partner Dan picked up the phone, he called our former employer, and miraculously within hours it sold our first consulting contract. And we used that contract to hire one of the smartest systems engineers we'd ever met in the satellite industry, satellite communications industry. He had preceded us at Cornell and Stanford grad school where we, where we had gone. Um, he wasn't a salesman, he was one of the best systems engineers in the country. And he was a hit. And we resolved always, always to hire people smarter than us to work with us. To build our business, we had to take some big risks though. Our competition was some of the biggest and most able communications companies in the world. And the only way we could compete with them is to convince the potential client that we had incredibly innovative answers to their problems. We painstakingly listened to them as they, as they assessed their problems. Then we designed and offered potential solutions in the marketing proposals for our services. At first, Dan was horrified that I insisted in sharing our proprietary information without any strings attached to people we barely knew. I asked him, what choice do we have? We have to convince these people that we're the best in the world or they're, or they're we're going to go with proven entities. The strategy worked. 
Within the first few months of our start, we won one of the most prestigious communication system design contracts at that time, consulting for Federal Express. We had several clients by then, and then, in order to grow from there, we had to use brute force techniques, and that included cold calling, calling perfect strangers, keeping them on the phone long enough to impress them so that they would agree to meet with us in person. That skill was absolutely key to our success in getting our company off the ground. So here I am at Allentown Airport, stuck, minutes from getting arrested, and I call the largest local newspaper in town and offer them a story for a place to sleep until the airport re reopens in the morning. And after some pleading and cajoling, the night editor agreed to do so. I turned the telephone over to the police to assure them that I'd be picked up and taken away from the facilities. A reporter comes to interview me, took some photos, and brought me to his home for a four-hour rest. The article on me appeared on the front page of the newspaper the next morning. Calls to offer assistance came in from all over the area, assistance of all types. One Vietnam War widow baked a cake saying, good luck, Roger, drove 60 miles, greeted me with a hug and a kiss, and asked me to marry her. <laughs> I have all kinds of other offers, food and transportation, even drugs. None, none of the office, none of the offers were for flights west. <laughs> the local radio station, WSAN, interviewed me and played the story every 15 minutes to encourage pilots to come and take me towards my destination. Finally, I had an offer to go to Youngstown, Ohio, which I grabbed. It was an orthodontist who brought, actually dragged, his poor daughter along, hoping that she would fall for an engineer rather than the guy she was dating at the time. <laughs> Pretty awkward. With minutes, within minutes of uh, arriving at the Youngtown, Youngstown FBO, place where you get gas, I was, uh, I was actually offered a flight choice between going, either going to Columbus, Ohio, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, in a big gamble, I decided to backtrack to go what I had un to go to to what I had understood at the time to be the bigger private airport, which was Pittsburgh. So we arrived there at 6:35 p.m. And by then, many of the FBOs, sort of in the northeastern part of the country, had heard about me, and uh, they were al alerted to my quest, so to speak. And so when I arrived, plenty of folks offered their help, but still no flights west were to be found. So I did it again. I got on the phone to the local large newspaper, in this case the Post-Gazette, and I offered a story for a place to sleep. But just as I was engaging in that conversation with that editor, a guy came up to me and offered me a trip to Columbus, Ohio. This time I accepted. And on the walk to that plane, another guy came up to me and said, would you like to go to St. Louis? St. Louis, the Mississippi, almost halfway. I, was, I, w I thought this was fantastic. But it was another orthodontist. Um, those guys make too much money. Um, I told the uh, pilot en route, we were on our way. I was pretty nervous about this private plane travel stuff especially in lousy weather. He responded by quoting a famous aviation author, Mr. Gann, no matter how careful, no matter how lucky, fate is the hunter. Those words, combined with his particularly lousy landing, reminded me of the gambler who does not know how to quit. I was in St. Louis now. It was 2 a.m roughly 36 hours into the contest. Dan and I like to travel. 
So when marketing opportunities for our services arose in Asia, we got pretty excited. Our venture capitalists were pretty negative. It takes a long time to win deals. You don't know the culture. You don't speak the language. You'll be wasting your time and our money, your most valuable assets. We thought, let's see. We can go to Pittsburgh. We can go to Columbus. We can go to LA. Or we can go to Beijing or Tokyo. We went to Asia. Well, over the next 10 years, we ended up winning almost $200 million in consulting contracts in Japan, Korea, and China. One of our clients later explained to me why. We had the best people, best technology, plus. We were the first Americans they met who listened first, recognized them as individuals, not as groups, and while clearly acting American, respected their local customs and mannerisms. And it is true that while Japanese seemed to dress awfully similarly at the time, we saw them as individual personalities and professionals. We remembered their names and their faces. And NEC, Sharp, Toshiba, Fujitsu, Hitachi loved our people. We had successfully built one of the largest independent groups of communication systems and distributed network specialists in the world. Many of these folks were PhDs and master's degrees from here. When praised about the quality of our staff, our co-founder, Berkeley professor Dave Messerschmidt, would respond that we also had world-class modesty. We also recruited to support a consulting business that grew over 40%. We recruited just in time uh, to grow 40% a year with a 30% free tax profit. And a big break for us came when we went to visit the head of information technology at United Parcel Service, the package delivery company, UPS. Frank had no interest in our telecom capabilities. He heard that we were smart engineers and he just wanted to meet us. So we asked him to tell us about his most pressing problems. And to our amazement, he ranted for an hour about how it took days for them to locate missing packages and this was increasingly a competitive embarrassment. We asked him if we could spend a couple of days with his people for free to better understand his needs. We told him he could use the results of our assessment in any way he pleased. Well, we designed a system for the company and got the go-ahead to build the delivery company's first automated package tracking and delivery system, one of the largest client server systems in the world at that time. The competition included companies like IBM. We delivered it on time, on budget, in full working order. And without folks like my cousin Robert, who got his PhD, brilliant engineer, it might not have other ha ever happened. But I'll be darned, we really did it. So I'm in St. Louis. And by this time, the whole US airspace knew about me. And the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, got into the act to help me rather than to arrest me. They invited me into their Midwest Air Traffic Control Center in St. Louis and started soliciting over the radio for rides to all the pilots in all the airplanes in the air. They wanted, they encouraged them to come and pick me up. They su suggested literally to pilots, why don't you drop by St. Louis and pick this student up and take him west which is exactly what a Rockwell Sabreliner jet did. A whole jet, a private jet, filled with salesmen slash pilots, they were both, returning from a worldwide trip of sales calls, were on board. And they were on their way to Los Angeles. That was a eureka moment. And the jet was landing at Lambert Field, only 30 miles away, well, 30 miles away. So I had to grab a cab to rush me through the early morning rush hour to uh, Lambert, to Lambert Airfield. I made the trip within the hour window I was given, and thank goodness the cabbie had heard about me on the radio because I told him at the end of the ride that I could not pay him. 
It was against contest rules. So I was on the way to the LA. It was unbelievable. Wow. Maybe I would just win this prize. Maybe it would happen. Turns out this contest had been tried 30 years uh, earlier by a magazine called Life Magazine, and no one ever made it. Um, no one won. And, uh, it had, and so this was the next try. Well, in spite of very beautiful, gorgeous early morning views, of course, I was exhausted. I drifted off to sleep, only to be nudged aggressively a few hours later on an approach to L.A., on the approach to L.A., to be told the plane had developed a complete failure of the horizontal stabilizer. Fortunately, the world's most experienced pilot for that plane was now at the controls, and emergency vehicles were lined up along the LAX Los Angeles Airport runway. All incoming traffic had been halted except for us. And we made a final approach and landing, usually using primarily speed control. Um, we landed safely, no incident. And uh, thank goodness we had the most talented pilot on board. Who, otherwise, who knows what, have, what would have happened. Well, our consulting company grew to over 250 engineers and 400 employees. We had offices in Japan, France, Australia, and England. And we grew with our own profits. No money beyond the $200,000 was invested, the original $200,000 was invested or loaned to us. We went public in 91. And once I told a respected advisor about our conservative financial model for growth, and he said that it was impossible to do so, impossible to do what I told him we had done. And I replied that I was very, very glad, since he was so highly regarded by me, that he did not tell me this earlier. Otherwise, I may have never done it. But we did falter in our growth for the first year as a public company. It was quite distracting and new. We grew steadily for five years thereafter. We developed software for digital signal processors, specialized microprocessors, and network management systems that was deployed worldwide. And we set the stage for very high growth markets for other companies, unfortunately, to grow in, um, in each of those areas, network management and telecom DSP. The investors who backed us with their 200K made over $100 million on their investment. And we did sort of a crash landing after 12 years. We, uh, our vision for growth was lacking. People, including yours truly, were not quite up to the task of growing beyond 100 million in sales. And eventually, the company was sold. Dan and I wanted to take the company in a new, into a new market, which we called the internet at the time. It was deemed to be too risky. So we left to start a VC firm. We were kind of tired of doing it all ourselves, and so we decided we would help others launch their own companies. All right. So here I am in Los Angeles, the West Coast, 400 miles from my goal. And the relieved and somewhat embarrassed Rockwell guys helped me meet a friendly flight base operator staff who quickly secured a flight on board a very famous singer-songwriter's private Learjet. Paul Anka is his name. He wrote the song, My Way. I thought that was appropriate. Um, he was not on the plane, but that plane took me to Monterey, only a hop, skip, and a jump from San Francisco, so I thought. It was a teeny airport. Would I get stuck there? The pilot of this Learjet upon learning that I was kind of associated with the press, decided to show off. He took the plane over the ocean. He told me to hold on to that cup of coffee while he rolled the plane around once. <laughs> the cup of coffee didn't go anywhere. Centrifugal force kept the coffee in the cup. He wanted to make that point. And it, the crew told me that uh, what he had just done was illegal. <laughs> and that s several weeks earlier, he had been fired from Delta 
doing that with a passenger jet with the crew on board. <laughs> we did land safely in Monterey. And how the heck was I going to get out of here? So close, and yet so far. As you heard, we call our venture firm the Rota Group. Our first investment was a search engine called Ask Jeeves, which went public, was eventually sold for $2 billion to a large public media company. And the second was PolyServe, which was sold to a large public computer company for, let's say, a, a, a very nice sum. Ask Jeeves was the ride of a lifetime, now called Ask.com. Within 24 months of our purchase of a four-person company, we had grown from 5,000 to tens of millions of users. And I got a big kick out of the fact that we developed this cartoon character. At that time and since then, it's the only cartoon character that ever actually kind of made it, but it didn't sustain itself on the internet. I still think there's room for somebody to do a branded service with a cartoon character. We had it for a while, but it didn't last. And PolyServe was based on an advanced clustered file system software built by simply brilliant engineers. Our solution was used by Fortune 500 companies and, federal, and the federal government to run mission critical applications. Well, after a bunch of successes and failures, and I know we want to discuss failures, um, why do things fail? Well, all kinds of reasons. Very often, it's because the market that you've identified isn't big enough. The larger the market, the more mistakes you can make to pursue it. Sometimes and frequently it was the execution, just not doing a good job of pursuing a market opportunity. And, uh, and sometimes um, get a little unlucky too. So we had, we had our fair share of, of, of failures. But Danny and I started focusing on our current and our greatest challenge. How to mitigate or attenuate or perhaps reverse the consequences of climate change. We think the world is not paying enough attention to the damage we are doing to our environment with man-made carbon released into the atmosphere. It's heating up our entire ecosphere. Let me show you this article, 1896, is an article about um, what happens if you put more carbon into the environment and the answer is you'll heat up the earth. It's written by a Nobel Prize winner at the time, a Swedish Nobel Prize winner. And he's referencing in it an article written in 1827, 1827, that documents scientifically how the Earth's environment and overall temperature is a function in large measure of the carbon in the environment, in the atmosphere. And then furthermore, this issue, which I personally believe is quite urgent, it was identified some time ago, um, more concretely. Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad. Well, it's been calculated a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottomed boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather were not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. Today, we don't put 6 billion tons of carbon into the environment. We put 30 billion tons of carbon into the environment per year. Um, MIT released some data 
a couple of years ago, and if there are no policy changes in what we're doing, there's a 95% chance that within the century we'll raise our Earth's temp over three degrees Celsius, which is enough to very dramatically change our environment. This is the, uh, what all climate scientists say is our danger point, two degrees. And uh, you don't want to be there. Drought, famine, floods. Um, and according to dozens, perhaps hundreds of climate scientists, we're destined for that without any policy changes and without any new technology to address these issues. And uh, this is what we might look like, which is if you, uh, the, the colors to the left are once you're beyond um, three degrees, you're in dust bowl conditions. Look at our country and look at the world and within your lifetimes. It's, um, it's serious data. I don't know why we would ignore the data of scientists but we kind of are. So many scientists, so many competent, peer-reviewed scientists. Well, we can do something about this, but it'll take a broad collective international willpower to do so, and, um, and some selfless leadership. And we need to marshal all of our economic and technical resources to take on this challenge. We really need to win this race, this race. The prize will not just be money for those of us who invest in relevant solutions, but it will also be the lives of our kids and our grandkids. It'll take a common vision, the greatest talent, fortitude, creativity, and let's face it, a lot of chutzpah, to ensure that we can bring this world back to an eco-equilibrium that can sustain life for the centuries ahead, human life for the centuries ahead. This is perhaps mankind's greatest opportunity and greatest test. My guess is that this will become quite apparent on your watch. So we're counting on you guys, fellow students, adventurers, engineers, scientists, business people, problem solvers, and leaders to band together and creatively tackle these issues. Well, it was a sunny, gorgeous day in Monterey and ultimate California weather. But not a soul was in the flight base operator, a lonely desk manager, and then a gift from heaven. A Chicago lawyer and his assistant bolted in requesting an urgent charter flight to San Francisco. I told them my story and they were delighted to help. Within 15 minutes, we were on our way. We arrived in San Francisco. I call the magazine's offices. They return the call to confirm that I'm actually in California. No cell phones in those days. I'm told that I had won. The weather that nearly ruined me got to Bill. He was in Maine. I made the trip in 52 hours and 10 minutes. I had spent 73 cents. I had won $500. I got in the cab to spend the night with my relatives in Berkeley. I completed the notes that I used to prepare today's remarks 34 years later. And I slept, and I slept. Then I returned home to complete my engineering degrees and go off to the races. Thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Sir. Clearly, it's in like the best interest of many business people to keep going with like where the energy crisis is going. It's very easy to make money doing that in the short term. What do you think are going to be the challenges, and like what do you think someone's going to need to do to like supplant that interest to make easy money and actually make somebody want to like do a concerted effort to mitigate what you should be proven? Um, well, that's the central question. Uh, the question is what. 
what do I think is necessary in order to change our behavior from sort of doing what we have been doing in the short term rather than taking on what is necessary, making the necessary changes um, in order to more effectively address the consequences of climate change. Did I get it? Is that, and, and there are several things that we're going to have to do um, in order to do this. We're going to have to have people do what I'm doing, which is to try to convince people that this is a more serious issue. It's, it's, it's a very hard thing to see. You can't see you can't see what's happening, so that makes it a much tougher thing. Um, it's not a clear and present danger. But the we need to listen to our scientists. We need to believe in these people who our societies trained to be capable and competent and honest. And we need to, we need to basically convince ourselves by having more talks like this and also taking action. What kind of action? Uh, Things like fees on carbon, carbon inputted fuel, carbon rich fuels and um, that are either developed in this country or imported into this country. And rather than take those fees, and rather than simply tax them and give them to governments, which so many individuals object to, let's take those fees and just distribute them to the people. Let's charge for the, the harm the carbon is doing and give that money back to individuals. No government involvement other than in the very basic administration. And then people will have more of an economic incentive to um, purchase things that are non-carbon related. Um, that's one idea. And then we need, our, we, we need to get our politicians to pay more attention to this, and we need we need a brilliant leader leaders to start paying attention. Um, those are some some ideas. It it does help when companies like Solazyme go public, and you see that you can make money developing renewable stuff. We need many more of those. There are a half dozen such companies now. We need dozens to encourage more investment in this area. Any other questions? Um, so how would you, uh, for example, uh, try to approach uh, these challenges uh, and in a sense kind of decoupling the design and engineering from politics? For example, you, you mentioned something. Uh, I was thinking about the, the Solinger case. Because, I mean, obviously, they got a lot of blames for securing the loans from the federal government. And you know, now, you know, that whole thing into, basically, they were doing that themselves. And then everyone's sort of blaming the uh, administration I think Solinder probably in a very material way isn't as big an issue. Even, even it's being made into a political issue during um, an election season coming up. In fact, we all know that probably some bad decisions were made, but the fact is that we need to take risks and many of these risks are not going to pay off. And the government needs to take risks, the individuals need to take risks, corporations need to do, take risks, and just like in my work, more often than not, I fail. But sometimes it works, and it works in such a way that it essentially pays for a lot of failures. And this country is a country that takes enormous risks and, take, and bets big dollars on those risks. What have we just done in a couple of wars? We've bet a lot more money than, than we bet on Solyndra. So we, we're a country that takes risks, and we need to remind people of this. This, this is an overblown issue so politicians can make points and counterpoints. But in fact, we all know better. We know that we have to take these risks and very often the risks will not pay off. But once in a while, great value, um, great economic value and great societal value will, be, um, will, uh, will occur. And we need to remind ourselves of that and not be distracted by things as obvious as frequent failures as we take these risks. So climate change is a global issue and you have your
experiences in Asia Pacific. So looking beyond the states, right? What do you think we should be paying attention to in terms of trends and what's happening in the in the uh, startup space? Well, I'm fascinated. Um, I'm not incredibly knowledgeable on this, but I, I, I have made the following observations. I have gone to conferences where it was obvious to me that China um, is, is, is much more efficient and actually putting in much more effort to address these issues for its own society, save one significant issue, a personal opinion, which I'll get to in a moment. They are developing more wind farms are committing to more solar power. So they know that in spite of the fact that they are probably becoming or ha already are one the worst polluter in the world um, by bringing on one coal fire plant a week or whatever it is, um, they also recognize that they have a tremendous environmental problem. So they're trying to do, they're trying to still provide their people growth while at the same time under um, investing in infrastructure that could then take on in renewal, provide renewable energy. That's good. But the research, they're doing a tremendous amount of research, more research, more federally funded, centrally funded research than us in the consequences of climate change. But to the extent that I've seen that research, a lot of it that I got interested in because I'm looking for investment opportunities in the area of carbon sequestration is not very innovative. I've been surprised seen a lot of papers and been surprised to see that in my personal opinion the science is not very innovative and that what others are doing even though there's a fraction of the funding in my opinion is much more creative much more bold so while the so I think a broader answer to your question is that we are simply not we're, we're investing but not we have not come to the reckoning yet when will we come to a reckoning when will we all change our behavior? We will change our behavior when we realize that now there are more 500-year floods, 500-year droughts like what is occurring in Texas now than we've ever had. These, these super disaster events are now occurring more per unit time and costing society more than we had ever imagined or planned for. When this becomes, unfortunately, super obvious as a hammer to a head, I think that we might have a better chance of marshalling our resources. But um, that's, I, I think that's what is going to have to happen. And we're seeing it, we're seeing what? Floods in Australia after seven years of drought. Climate change is here. It's man made, uh, man made that's accelerating it. And um, we just, we need to look at the statistics. And they'll become more obvious. And the more, the wait, longer we wait, the tougher it will be for us to address these issues, which is why I'm encouraging all of you to take on this challenge. If it's not your entire job, make it part of your job to take on this challenge and think about it and do something about it, which you can do. I like to think that the examples I gave you are examples that will encourage you that special things can happen in your life. You can make a difference and, and, and then contribute to society as a whole. I saw another hand. Sir? Um, thanks for coming. The, the quest story is really great. Um, so clearly you're very passionate about the environment. At the root of the, what metrics do you guys use to evaluate companies and pick the ones that you think are going to make the most bang for the buck in terms of the environmental impact? Well, um, the question is what metrics are we looking for in, um, in new investments that relate to the economic opportunities associated with the consequences of climate change? Is that okay? And I could tell you we care deeply about the people and whether the people are the kind of people we used to be working day and night to pursue a passion, working so hard that they would make, we, we worked so hard that we would make all our mistakes in a compressed period of time because we knew we were going to make all the mistakes. I and mean, so we care a lot about the quality of the people, smarts, energy, um, humility. Um, we care about the idea. Is the idea truly innovative? We're seeing tech all kinds of interesting technologies and it, the ideas have to be highly innovative. And we now have a sense of where the technologies are worldwide. We've made the investment over the last several years. As engineers and scientists, we can, we're reasonably competent at assessing 
the state of the art in the areas that we're focusing in. And so we, we assess, is, is, this, is this truly innovative? And then in the markets that they're identifying, are they large markets? The larger the market, as I said earlier, the more mistakes you can make. So it's the quality of people, the innovation of the idea, and is the market large enough? And can they prove this within a short period of time? Um, can they prove it not within a decade? Can they prove their idea within some economic sort of pilot, economically valuable pilot within a year or a maximum of two years? So they need to prove something of economic value within two years. I think that's pretty much a direct, that's what we look for. And we have to really enjoy spending time with these people because we're going to spend a lot of time with them, supporting this very early stage stuff. Great question. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Happy holidays. <laughs>